My life is filled with joy. I'll lift you up no matter what. Yeah, that's, the, that's the, what the Word teaches us to do. That's what the Lord does in our life. That's what brings strength in us. It's a, it's a heavenly nevertheless is what it boils down to, regardless of what happens in our life. The Lord's working in it. The Lord has it under control. He tells us to trust Him and to seek Him and that He has all these things worked out. For all things work together for the good to those who love him and those that are the called according to his name and his purpose and he will. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and last week we looked at the very first one. That's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Against such, there is, no, there is no law. In other words, these fruit of the Spirit don't have a law concerning them. They don't come from a law like the Ten Commandments or some of the other commands and the restrictions that God has already given to His people. They, these are a work completely independent of that, and they are fruit of the Holy Spirit. They are not manufactured by obeying a law or following a command or any of those other things that, that we count or we attribute Christian maturity to, that this is something that is placed in us by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit grows it and matures it and pushes it forth in our life. And so these elements are not elements like the world can give, because there's a cheap imitation of every single one of those fruit of the Spirit. Every single one of them can be produced in some small manner by the world that we live in. And so it is the Holy Spirit's empowerment of all of this that recreates in us the character of Jesus Christ. Because this earth needs two things now that Jesus is not on it anymore. When Jesus was here, of course, Jesus walked on this earth and he performed miracles and he commanded things and he straightened issues out and he dealt with sin and rebellion and he, he cast out things and cleaned things and manifested the presence of the miraculous working of God in this world. And he also, as his character displayed, such a tremendous love in spite of all of that bitterness and hatred that was spewed at him and a tremendous peace in his life, even though uh, things were in constant turmoil and constant upheaval around him and lies were told and, and, and diabolical schemes were represented against him and all of these terrible things, but peace just prevailed. And then, of course, joy where Jesus himself said that his cross that he was about to go to was a joy that was set before him. And only, and only the Holy Spirit could make things that are horrible like this count as, a, as, a, as something that is beneficial into our life. And so that's where we are in the fruit of the Spirit. In the book of Nehemiah, I'm just going to call one, one other passage about this. In the book of Nehemiah, and I know that's everybody's favorite book, and uh, you've been there many times. <laughs> but, uh, but in the book of Nehemiah, there's a, there's a worship service going on in chapter 8. And Ezra, the priest, is uh, leading in this, in this evangelistic service to the Lord. And Ezra st brings out the book of the law, and the people are standing out in the streets, and they're all listening to what God's saying to them. And Ezra starts reading in the morning, it says, and he read from morning until midday. And the people stood and the people cheered and the people listened as the word of God was read before them. And then as he finished that, that, that phrase, he, he, he said to them, uh, go your way. This was a feast day. Go your way. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. Send portions to those from whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy before the Lord, and neither be you grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he said that, that, that joy gives us something and gives us a tremendous strength. And, and what is this joy? I, the first thing I remember hearing about joy was a corny little song 
I know some of you will remember it, you know, when you were a teenager or when you first heard about the joy, what did it say? Uh, I, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. To <laughs> I like those. I got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Boom, down in the depths of my heart. <laughs> I, the one verse I like is, and if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a tack. Ouch, sit on a tack. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, a, that's, one of those, that's one of those corny little songs. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of truth in that because this joy that's down in our heart is a strength in our life, and, and it takes us places that, uh, that we would, would not be able to go without this tremendous joy, and it represents us and grows us so that our character is more like Jesus as this fruit grows in our life. Now, how would we talk about and what are we talking about when we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit? Because as I say to you the word joy... I know that each of you have a thought in mind of what joy is. I mean, we, we can all remember times where we were joyous. Usually there are moments of time, like when we get married. That might be some of your memory as a joyous time. Or uh, when you had your first child, or that was a joyful time. When your child started to school, that was a wonderful, joyous time. When they graduated from high school, boy, that was even a greater joyous time. When they went off to college, whoo, what a joyous time was that. When they just got out, it was a joyous time <laughs> on that. I mean, we can remember, and these are, are momentary times of joy. And, and although we can all kind of describe it a, a little, and we certainly know when we feel that, but how would you define that, huh? What would be the definition of joy if somebody said, what is the difference between the joy that the world gives and the joy that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? And I, those of you that have the outline that I give out every Sunday, I tried to write it here. It's a pretty lengthy paragraph, pretty, pretty lengthy paragraph on the, at the start of the notes. And I did this in an effort to try to define for you what the joy that is the fruit of the Spirit is all about. Webster, I'm going to just read a second from here, and then and I want us to look at some more scripture. Webster's Dictionary defines joy as the emotion evoked by well-being or success or good fortune or by the prospect of blessing, of possessing what one desires. That's a good definition of joy, of the joy the world gives, but I need to add in there, you might want to write in notes, because notice that it's all going toward us. I mean, notice that definition is all about us and about where, how we're going to receive and we're going to possess. And, and so the, the joy that the world gives is all about us receiving something that we're after in some way. But what about the joy that's identified in Galatians 5.22 as the fruit of the Holy Spirit? After all, it's not the fruit of the saints, it's the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the fruit is not something that we can produce on our own. And I want to take you to a passage, and I hope I don't get sidetracked. I just want, to, I just want you to see what this passage says about what I, I, I'm, I'm about, to, what we're about to look at about the joy of the Lord and where it comes from and what it really is and, and, and how it works in our life and how it, how it blesses us in, in all kinds of ways that seemingly you, you would not notice. Here's, Jesus says in, in John 15, he's talking to his disciples. This is just, this is the night before or the night of the, when he goes to Gethsemane to pray, you know, and he takes those three disciples and they can't even stay awake long enough to pray for him. And, and then they come into the garden and they arrest him and then they put him on trial and they scourge him and all of that. And he's crucified the next day. I mean, this is that night. He's talking to his disciples before they come and get him. And, and he says in John 15, the first verse, I am the true vine. Now, the reason he had to say true vine is because in the Old Testament, Israel is described as the vine. And, of course, to 
the Old Testament law, the, you had to be attached to Israel. You had to be attached to the vine, so to speak. Jesus says, I want you to know that I'm the true vine. Yeah. I'm the real thing, and my father is the vine dresser. He's the one that takes care of the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up, gets you off the ground because you think you're a root if you're laying on the ground. And of course, roots don't grow fruit, right? Roots try to be roots, and if you're a branch and you try to be a root, you're not going to bear fruit because you think you're a root, but you're not going to be a root either because you're a branch. You're going to try to put roots down, but you don't put roots down because you're not a root. You're a branch. And so that verse says, Jesus said, if God sees you like that, he lifts you up off of the ground and puts you on the trellis so that you can bear fruit like a limb should or a branch. And so he says, I'm the, I'm the true vine, and, and this is how we produce fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. I want you to know this, is la this last line. For without me, you can do nothing. What is nothing, by the way? <laughs> nothing is zero, right? Zero with the rim knocked off of it, if you want to look at it that way. It, it, it is nothing. Jesus said, this is not something that you can do. This is something that you get from me as you stay with me, as you abide with me, the vine is going to produce this in you. This is not something you can do on your own. If anyone does not abide in me, look at his neighbor and say, I hope that's not you. Yeah, if you, if you, if you will not trust me, if you will not come to me, if you don't know me, if you don't abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. That mean, can I ask for anything? I mean, is this a blanket check? Is this a blank check to say, hey God, uh, how about a golden Cadillac here? You know, how about, a, how about a big bank account? How about a wonderful mansion in life? Can I, I mean, is that what he's saying that I can ask for anything? No, 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 no. I can ask for anything that it takes for me to stay attached to the vine. It means if I abide in him and his words abide in me, whatever I need to stay attached to the vine and to abide in him and produce more fruit, I can ask God for and God will give it to me. Yeah, yeah. I need a better understanding of the word, presto. Let me inspire your teachers and your leaders to speak something to you that's going to bless your heart or for you to see it or as you read the word, the Holy Spirit lightens it up for you and you see things that you've never seen before and it blesses you and it helps you stay attached to the vine. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. The way people will know that you're my disciples is if you bear fruit. This world's going to see something different in you. And if, if you will stay attached to the vine, the Holy Spirit, who, if you want to basically boil it down to thinking in that analogy, the Holy Spirit, like the sap in the vine, flows into you. And as the Spirit flows into you, because you're not the vine, you're a branch, and you can do nothing without the vine, Jesus said, stay attached, stay abiding in me, and the Holy Spirit, that is the life of the vine, will flow into you, and you'll start bearing fruit that looks like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, and the world will look at you and say, who could do this? Who can live like this? Who could be this kind of person? That in spite of their circumstances, in spite of everything that is negative in their life, man, things just flow out of them that are unbelievably joyous. 
in the face of failure, in the face of, of restriction, in the face of harm, in the face, uh, joy just, whoo, just pushes out of their life. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Because Jesus said you do this because you, you abide in the vine, not because you're a good person. It's not the fruit of the saints. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And so it's not something we can produce it is something that has to be produced in us by being attached to the vine. For without him, we can do nothing. And my father's glorified when you bear a lot of fruit because the world looks at you and glorifies him that you are one of his disciples. As the father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you. I'm telling you about staying attached to the vine. I'm telling you that without the vine, you can't do anything. I'm telling you that if you abide in the vine and, you, and, the, and the vine abides in you, you can do any of these things because it is the power of the vine that brings strength to you. These things I have spoken to you that my joy, Jesus said, might remain in you. Why did Jesus teach us about the vine? Why did Jesus tell us about the vine and about the fact that, that without it, we can do nothing? Because Jesus said, I'm full of joy. I laid down my life, he said, for the joy that is set before me. Whew. You mean that joy of getting beaten half to death within a few hours of when you said that? You mean that joy of being spit on and cursed, that joy of being defiled and descended, that joy of, of dragging a cross through the streets and becoming so uh, uh, bloodlet and worn out that somebody had to be called to drag it for you the rest of the way? Is that the joy you're talking about, Jesus? Or how about being nailed onto that thing and being thudded down in the ground? Is that the joy that you're talking about, Jesus? What a, what a, what a misconception about joy. That doesn't look joyful to me, Jesus said. I'm telling you these things so that my joy will, be, will remain in you and that your joy might be full. Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus said, if my joy is going to be full in you, you're going to have to understand this. This is where my joy comes from. And so joy is altogether linked to, I think, three things. And I, I wrote it in your outline down here toward the bottom. That joy produces a very noticeable feeling. I think we could all agree, but it's more than that. It's also a confident abiding in the vine. Christian joy is like a, a security. I sense a security. Because all I have to do is stay attached to the vine. Yeah. That's, my, that's my charge. I got to produce joy. I got to produce love. I got to produce peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. No, no, I just have to stay attached to the vine. Mm -hmm. If I stay attached to the vine, the Holy Spirit is going to birth out love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. That is a security in the midst of all of my junky mess-ups in life, right? Man, I can get off track in a heartbeat. It is also confidence. It is, it is, it is uh, knowing that all of our life derives from the vine. It's not only a security of staying attached, it's a, it's a comfort knowing that if I stay attached, Everything I need is going to be flowing into me. Yes. So I'm not only secure with the fact that, 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 that if my job is to stay attached and that's all I need to focus on, I'm also comforted in that if I stay attached, uh, God's going to do everything in me he needs to do so that I can abide in him. And then lastly, it, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's knowing that as our future unveils, it's a confident expectation that everything's going to be okay. As I draw life from the vine, no matter what the circumstances may be. In other words, 
the fruit of the Spirit, the joy that is the fruit of the Spirit is already, is really a defiant nevertheless to the trials and troubles we face. The fruit of joy is, it doesn't matter what I face. Whatever it is, God's going to take me through. And it's going to be okay. In spite of the fact that it may look terrible, it may look like a defeat, a loss, a hurt, God's going to bring me through. So the joy that is the fruit of the Spirit gives me security, it gives me comfort, and it gives me confidence that everything's okay in spite of how terrible it might look. And Jesus said, if you can grasp this, my joy is going to fill you up. And it's going to make me happy because my joy is filled up in you. So, there are, about three, there are a little over 300 verses in the Bible that contain the word joy or rejoice, which is another form of joy. And we could spend our time going through a lot of those verses and reading them. And, and you would be encouraged, yeah, that's the joy of the Lord. And the joy, of, you know, and rejoicing, we're commanded to rejoice. In me. But I, I don't think that would do us a, a whole lot of good because it would just basically be, look, I, I, I just hear the same command over and over and over and over and over about joy. Would you like to see how the joy of the Lord looks in real life? Because in the book of Philippians, and the reason I've chosen Philippians, really you could look at almost any story in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is involved in and see this joy of the Lord uh, repeated over and over how it affects life. I mean, I know lots of times we hear things like this. You say, the joy of the Lord, awesome, baby, I want some. Let's do it, all right? Well, what would it look like if, if it came out of your life? What, what could you expect it to be like if the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength and, and work out of your life. Well, I chose the book of Philippians because the book of Philippians is called the joy book, by the way. It's got, it's got, it's got many great words in it, many great verses in it, you know, that the Holy Spirit has birthed out. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's one of the verses that are there. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a Verse out of Philippians, those things that were, that I counted, those things that I counted as gain, I now consider loss for Christ. I press toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The book of Philippians, the joy book, in it, there's a story right in the very first chapter where the apostle Paul uh, shares and we see some attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, how the fruit of the Spirit operates in life. There are four attributes that I want us to look at. First one is this. Joy gives you a perspective to live from. If the joy of the Lord is in your life, the joy of the Lord is going to give you a point of view. Now, all of us have a point of view. You came in here with one, and you have one now. All of us also came in here with problems. The difference in perspective, the difference in point of view is how you look at these problems in life. So we all have them. If you want to see if you have problems, just like take this right hand and two fingers and put them right here in this little, this little soft spot. And if you feel something beating in there, uh, you, you've got problems, right? Yeah, yeah. So... Jo the joy of the Lord gives me a perspective about how to look at my problems. If the joy of the Lord is going to give me security and confidence and comfort as I stay abiding in the vine, then, the then it's going to change the way I look at things. And just so that you'll know that the Apostle Paul, when we read these few things that we're about to read so we can see this, these attributes of the joy, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, I want you to know that Paul did not write this in some ivory tower on Marshmallow Lane and Cotton Candy Boulevard. 
that this indeed is, 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 is a point of view because the book of Philippians is one of the prison epistles. What does that mean? It means, well, Paul was in prison when he wrote the book of Philippians. He wrote the book of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and uh, to a slave owner called Philemon. All four of those written while Paul was in prison in Rome awaiting to be sentenced after four years of life being the pits for him. He had spent two years in Caesarea in jail on a trumped up charge. I submit to you that'll make anybody bitter. Then he was put on a ship going to Rome so he could appear before Nero, so Nero could make a judgment of his life. And Nero uh, never did anything nice. He wasn't known for his nicety to Christians. On the way, the ship ran into a storm called Eurachlodon. And Eurachlodon tore the ships into pieces. And everybody on the ship, including the Apostle Paul, barely made it to a shore alive. And as they drug up on the shore, the occupants of that island began to drag the wood up and stack it up for a big bonfire. And as Paul was dragging a piece of wood up, uh, the, the, the island was inhabited by a, a, a deadly type of snake. And as Paul reached down to grab the wood and drag it to the fire, one of those snakes latched onto him. And everybody said, oh, poor Paul, he's going to die. And as a matter of fact, they said, God must really be after him. Because he survived the shipwreck, and now look at this, the snake's bitten him, and he's going to die. So he must really be a bad person. And he shoot the snake off in the fire and never did get sick. And the people were impressed and began to look at him as, as a man from, from God. But after a few months of winter on that island, another ship picked him up, and, and he was taken to Rome where he spends another two years being chained to two Roman guards, one on each side, every four hours, the shift changes, and he's attached to these two guards for 24-7. Can you say no privacy? <laughs> you feeling a little better about your problems now? <laughs> yeah. So the Apostle Paul had every reason to have this gigantic pity party to look at God and say, God, I'm just trying to work for you and, and I've done this and I've given up my life and I've laid down everything and what have I got from you, God? Nothing. But the apostle Paul didn't look at life that way. Why? Because the fruit of joy filled his life and gave him a different perspective. Look at exactly what he did say, beginning at chapter 1, verse 12. But I want you to know, he's writing to the Philippians now, he says, and he's in prison, and all this stuff that I just told you happened has already happened to him, and he's sitting there with guards on each side in a damp, dark prison in Rome, awaiting to be sentenced, probably have his head cut off, which is ultimately what happened. But, but this is what he's doing. And he says, but I, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. What a perspective, right? All of his problems must be gone, right? Well, no, no, he's still got the same problems. But the joy gives you a perspective of life. It's the joy of the Lord that allows you to look at horrible things with any sense of it's going to be okay. Let me read you. Let me, I want to read you. This is a little letter I've had. Man, I've had this thing forever. It's a little letter that was written by uh, a girl in college to her parents. And, uh, and, uh, and it's a good example of how the perspective that you receive something affects the way you act. Let me just read it to you. Uh, dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry to be so long in writing. Unfortunately, all of my stationery was destroyed the night our dorm was set on fire by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now, and the doctors say that my eyesight should soon return. The wonderful boy, Bill, who rescued me from the fire, kindly offered to share his little apartment with me until the dorm is rebuilt. He comes from a good family, so you won't be surprised when I tell you that we're going to be married. 
In fact, since you've always wanted a grandchild, you'll be glad to know that you'll be grandparents next month. P.S. Please disregard the above practice in English composition. There was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not pregnant, and I don't even have a steady boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in chemistry, and I just wanted to be sure that you received this news in the proper perspective. <laughs> yeah, 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 the proper perspective of, of life. Because it's the perspective that we look at things with that changes the way we react. And so, and so how, what happens when, when, we, when we look from this perspective? Well, according to verse 13, this is the first thing that happens. The first thing that happens is that, uh, that, that, that it influences the lost around us. So that, I mean, this thing's worked out to the furtherance of the Lord so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. In other words, when the lost people around here look at me, people like the palace guards, when they look at me, they're saying to me things like, well, I guess, I, I, you know, I, I mean, we, we weren't really with you, but, but uh, it looks like God has brought you here and that God is, is working in you. I mean, no one could have a perspective like that unless God would put him in it. I mean, I'm sure Paul had, I mean, the Bible says, and Paul says many times before he goes to Rome on this ship and is in, in the jailhouse dungeon, he says many times that he feels that God is going to take him to Rome and he's going to preach in Rome. But I'm sure that Paul had a whole different point of view or plan about how he was going to go to Rome. I'm sure Paul's thoughts were, I'm going to rent the Colosseum in Rome, and I'm going to put out my billboards and my posters about the big evangelistic Christ for Christ meeting at the Colosseum, and we're going to fill the Colosseum up with people like a big Billy Graham crusade. I, I'm, I know Paul didn't meet Billy Graham, but you, you know what I mean. Like a big like a big Billy Graham, and I'm going to stand and preach, and there are going to be hundreds or maybe even thousands of people saved because God's going to give me the power to preach in the Colosseum in Rome. I'm, I feel sure that's kind of what he had in mind, but God had a different perspective. God said, I'll tell you how we're going to get you to Rome, Paul. We're going to put you, we're going to give you an all expense paid trip to Rome on the prison plan. And we're going to chain you to two guards that are going to rotate every four hours. And these are not just any guards. These are palace guards. These are the praetorium guards. These are the elite soldiers of Rome. And we're going to take two of them, and, 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 and we're going to put two of them, one on each side, and every four hours, we're going to change those guards up. By the way, I didn't mention that these guards are the guards that, that can retire after 12 years, and after 12 years, these guards become leaders in Rome. So God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you on the prison plan. We're going to let Nero foot the bill and we're going to chain you every four hours to two of the leaders that will be leaders in, in, in Rome. And we're going to give you, them an opportunity to hear everything you say for four hours. And then the next bunch is going to come in for four hours. And then the next bunch is going to come in for four hours. And, the next, and imagine how God could influence the whole Roman Empire by having the future leaders be strapped. I mean, I'm wondering, okay, who is the prisoner here? <laughs> so Paul says, you know, when the Holy Spirit gives me joy, and that joy gives me the security of knowing that, that all I have to do is stay attached to the vine and the comfort of knowing that God's going to do everything I need through the vine and the confidence to know that whatever happens to me, God is going to work it and work it out in my life. It, it, it allows me to act in a way that influences the lost so that when they see me doing this, uh, they're affected by it. Also, in verse 14, and most of the brethren in the Lord. <laughs> brethren in the Lord means that uh, these are the other believers that are there. So it not only influences the loss, it affects the other believers that are there. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my change, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So here's the perspective you know this verse by heart, right? 
For we know, same Paul that was right there wrote Romans. And in Romans, he said, For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. So the comfort of joy is that every God has a purpose behind every one of my problems. I'm comforted by the joy of the Lord to know that no matter how it looks, no matter how it looks, God has a purpose behind every single one of my problems and that God is going to work them through me if I'll abide in the vine. It's joy. It's the joy of the Lord that gives, that, gives us that. Second attribute. Second attribute. Joy establishes a priority to live by. Just simply stated, this means that when things really get tough, I, I, I need to know what's really important. I need, to, I need to know what the priorities are. I mean, a, a, abiding joy focuses me on what is significant and what's trivial. I don't know about you, but one of the problems I have in life is to know what is significant and what's trivial in my life. To know treasure from trash, right? I mean, you have problems with that? Yeah. Sometimes I look at things that I think are trash and they end up being treasure. I'm sure that I have... I'm sure that I attached Mickey Mantle's rookie card to the spokes of my bicycle to sound like a motor running down the road when I was about six years old because I couldn't tell the difference between treasure and trash. <laughs> my motto almost now is don't throw anything away. It's going to come back. Uh, how many of you would like to have that 64 Mustang that you had at one time? What could you get? I mean... It, it, so I'm saying that it is the abiding joy in me that allows the Holy Spirit to show me in life what is significant and what is trivial. Because I'm either gonna I'm I'm, I'm either gonna decide what is important in my life, or I'm gonna let others decide what's important in my life. And if you let others decide what is important in your life, I'm going to guarantee you that you're going to spend most of your life putting out fires. You are going to, if you let others decide what is significant in your life, you're going to move from problem to problem to problem to problem. Well, what was, what was Paul's problem? Well, in the next verse, it said, some indeed preach Christ from envy and strife. You know, he said, just a reminder, okay, God put me here. I'm, the furtherance of the gospel is going forward, and the lost people are saying, man, well, that God you have, he must be something because I believe that he's put you here. And then the other believers say, yeah, and they start preaching the gospel because they're encouraged by that. And then the next verse, Paul says, but you know, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, Supposing they add affliction to my chains, Paul, Paul's saying, you know, some people aren't, uh, they're criticizing and their agenda's not real and they're, they're mocking me is what he's basically saying and they think that by mocking me, they're going to make me sad. They're going to add affliction to my chains. And then some, uh, the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. So the apostle Paul is saying, I'm not only in prison, but there are people out there attacking my ministry. Now, if you want to, uh, have something in your life that'll steal your joy quicker than almost anything else in your life. Just let people start criticizing you. But notice the response of joy, even though it's true that they're mocking him, they're ridiculing, and that's going on, and he's in prison, and he can't really do a lot about it. Here's the perspective that the joy of the Lord gives him. What then? Oh, what then? What, what should I do about it? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Paul said, I don't care. You see what the perspective of joy has done? The comfort of joy has done? The security of joy? The confidence in knowing that whatever happens in my life, God is in control of it. And that it's going to have a, an eternal amen at the end of it. Paul says, well, if they criticize me. If they're putting me down, uh, nothing I can do about that. That's okay. I just, uh, it doesn't matter whether people are preaching about him because they love him or they preaching, they're preaching about him because they hate him. Just so Christ is preached, that's really the only thing that really matters. 
after all, isn't it? So here's the priority. In everything you do, put God first, and he'll direct you and crown your efforts with success. And the security is prioritize your life. And I gave you a little acrostic to show you what that meant. I believe, Billy, that's, that's, you say that all the time. That's, that's, <laughs> Jesus over you. Well, in the priorities of life, you put, your, you put Jesus first, put others second, and put yourself third. That's the priority of life. One of the things that I believe about this society that we live in is one of the reasons why it is joyless is because it is so um, selfish in its nature. It's, it's all about me, you know, the me generation. The greater response is about others. So the second attribute is that it gives me a power. Here's the third attribute. Joy provides a power to live on, a strength to keep going. Now, why do I need a strength to keep going? Well, because life's going to wear me out, right? Especially if you have children. Uh, I saw years ago, I wish I had cut it out and kept it, but I do remember it. So one of those little uh, point of view cartoons, you know, the little, the little uh, editorial looking little cartoons that you see, and it was, it's just a one frame kind of deal. And in this frame, it has this very frazzled looking lady standing in the door of her home, what looks like to be her home. And her hair's all messed up and her, and her curls are kind of sagging down in her face and her clothes are all musked up and she has a baby in her arms and, yep, it is crying. It looks like it's crying to the top of his voice. And there are three kids that are running around her feet down here and the dog is barking and she's looking really worn out and then the pollster's standing there with a little clipboard in his hand and his pencil and he says, uh, what do you mean you're undecided? All I asked you was, do you live here? <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you, do you ever feel like that? Yeah, do you ever feel like that? I mean, uh, one crisis after another, right? One, one, one hit after another. Matter of fact, a lot of times you don't even get one hit go, gone before you get hit with something else. It's not one after another. It's one on top of another. So when you came in here today... Some of you came in here ready to throw the towel in. I mean, you came in here uh, pushing one foot and dragging the other. <laughs> ready to hang it up, right? Ready, ready to throw in the towel. I've done the best I could, but my best is not good enough. And so whether it's your marriage or your children or, or your finances or a job or whatever it is, I mean, it's like, what else can I do? I've done everything that I've done. And life seems to be so difficult and so hard. And so what does the fruit of joy do with that kind of feeling in life? Well, the next verse, verse 19 says, for I know that this will turn out for my joy for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by my life or whether by my death. Two things that give me strength in spite of my problems, according to what Paul says here. Number one, the prayers of other people, and number two, the help of the Holy Spirit. That in whatever situation is going on, he says, uh, it's going to turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of, of Jesus. And the key word, I think, there is the word hope, a well-founded, well-grounded expectation for the future and, 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 and a confident expectation of what God's going to do. And so where does that hope come from? Some say, well, from myself. Well, that's great. Can you, can you always rely on yourself? I mean, you know yourself, right? <laughs> you, you know you. And so, can you always count on you to have everything that you need? <laughs> Negatory. So what's God's answer to this energy crisis? 
our power comes Philippians 4, 13. Justin used to have this on the inside of his baseball cap. I think it was right up here in the top. Wasn't that what he had? Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the confidence of joy says, with God's power working in me, then nothing can overwhelm me in life. So the fruit, of the, joy, the fruit that joy gives me gives me a perspective that I can live from, gives me a, a priority that I can live by, and a power that I can live on. As long as I stay attached to the vine, the vine pumps this in me. Let me give you this last attribute here. Joy targets a purpose in our life to live for. The Apostle Paul is old and tired, and he spent four years in prison, and they've taken away from him everything that that is important to him in life. They've taken away his friends. They've taken away his church. They've taken away his freedom. They've taken away his privacy. They've taken away everything that they can take except one thing that they can't take, and that is his purpose for living. Let me give you an investment tip about your life. Here it is. If you want to invest your life in something, invest it in something that's going to outlast you. Paul says in the next verse, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is not the statement of a suicidal man. This is Paul's statement that says, hey, I'm just saying that I'm not afraid to die. But I'm also saying that I'm not afraid to live either, which can be a lot scarier in life. One of the reasons why we need Christ in our life is not because we're going to die as soon as we walk out of this service. The main reason we need Christ in our life is because we're going to live another day. And we're going to have to face this world. And we need strength and power and joy and love so that we can face this world with the proper perspective and the proper thoughts and the proper confidence in life. And so Paul says, while I'm here, while I'm alive, I have a purpose, and that purpose is for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. My purpose is to live for Christ. Now, I'm going to put this on the screen from a couple of chapters later, just to kind of give you a little, to spread it out and to look at what he said about his purpose was. Look at this. Verse 12, not that I've already attained, Paul says, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm all that. Uh, I'm not saying I've arrived where I need to be or I'm already perfected. But I do press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Every one of us have been laid hold of by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God has a purpose for me. I have been saved for a purpose. God has laid hold of me and has given me a purpose. So brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended. In other words, I haven't arrived and looking for somewhere else to go. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, okay, this is my purpose in life. I'm striving to move toward Christ. That's what I'm striving for. And so anything that happens in my life, I forget those things which are behind me and I press on toward those things which are ahead of me. And, and, it, and he says, it's a prize for the, for the high calling of God. So the fruit of joy gives me the confidence, the encouragement to do that kind of living in life. And Paul says, uh, this is what Christ does on the inside of me. Verse 22, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor yet what shall I what I shall do choose I cannot tell for I'm hard pressed between the two having the desire to part and be with Christ which is far better nevertheless to remain in the flesh is more needful for you and being confident of this I shall I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy and faith the joy of faith that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again in other words I know a lot of times we might even wonder in our own life you know why doesn't, why doesn't God take us on to heaven when we get saved? I mean, why, why, why wait? Why, why wouldn't God, why, why whenever I didn't give my heart, right when I said yes to Christ, why wouldn't God take me home? 
Yeah, well, that the Apostle Paul just told us. He said, you know what? Now that Christ is in my life, I have the desire. It's okay with me to go home. Matter of fact, I'm kind of torn between whether I would like to stay here or, or whether I would go home, but it obviously, it's obvious that God's going to leave me here for a purpose, and that purpose is so that I can encourage you and I can be a witness for Him. And, and that's true about, about all of our life. So we, we have a, a power that lives on the inside of us to, to live on. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. How, how would you fill in that blank. For me to live is what? Is power. For me to live is uh, pleasure or prestige or power or popularity. <laughs> For me to live is Christ. You know, the, the, the thing that's wrong with those others is that they don't even last a lifetime, do they? They're very temporary. Much less an eternity. And so, it's really a very foolish thing to not prepare ourselves for that which we know is going to happen one day. We know one day we're going into eternity. Whether we're here or alive on the earth when Christ comes back or whether we go on in death, we know we're going into eternity. And not to prepare for that is a very foolish thing. And so, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, I have to have something on the inside of me that gives me that assurance and that confidence and, and that security. And, and Galatians said, it's the fruit that's working in you. It's that fruit of the Spirit that's birthing out of you what you, what you need to endure in life. So I, I'm just asking you have, you, have you given yourself to Christ? Is this a reality in your life? I mean, you know one day... You're going to go and stand before him. So are you ready for that? Have you prepared for that? I tell you, as a matter of fact, just close your, close your eyes. Bye-bye your head right now. And close your eyes.